Good evening. Thanks for tuning in to the League of Women Voters, Texas, Conversation with the Candidates series. Today we're going to be talking to the candidates that are running for Texas, Ag Texas Railroad Commissioner. Uh, we have three candidates that are here today. All candidates were invited, but three were actually able to attend. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Rita Hicks, my, the co-host, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Texas Railroad Commission. Thanks, Darrell. Well, the Rail Railroad Commission has a little bit of a misleading name. When it was formed in 1891, it's the oldest regulatory agency in the state. It actually did regulate railroads and later trucking and buses, but those functions were all taken over by the federal government over the years. So now the Railroad Commission is essentially a natural resource governing body, and it oversees our oil and gas industry, uh, pipeline safety, safely and liquefied uh, petroleum gas industry and surface uh, coal and uranium mining, um, essentially all natural resource functions. We want to encourage you at home to log on to lwvtexas.org or give the league a call at 512-472-1100 for more information. Also, to pull up a ballot specific to where you live, you can log on to vote411.org and it'll pull up a ballot specific to where you live with all the candidates. Our first candidate today uh, that's running for railroad commissioner is Mr. Stephen Brown. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to run for ag for a railroad commission? Mm -hmm. Well, first, thank you, Darrell and Rita, for having me here today to talk about the issues and my candidacy. Uh, the Railroad Commission has always been known as a very powerful agency, a very important agency within the state of Texas. And um, having worked in in Austin for as long as I've worked in Austin since 1998. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with this agency uh, and work on a lot of issues that this agency deals with, uh, such as eminent domain issues and environmental issues and things of that nature. And so uh, for me, it was almost a no-brainer in knowing that as we grow into this um, expansion of oil and gas activity in our state, that this commission operates the way that it should operate in order to keep everybody safe, make sure that everyone has a voice at the table. And from what I've seen um, for at least the last decade or so, that this commission has not allowed for voices to be heard at the commission level and then allow those voices to influence policy outcomes and rulemaking outcomes. And so uh, I know there's a lot of frustration uh, within the state. I know there's a lot of uh, dissatisfaction within the state as it relates to how responsive this agency has been to everyday Texans. And I want to make sure that I can be their voice. And, and I think that on a commission of three people, they deserve to have at least one commissioner, at least one, to be a representative, a, a representative of their issues, their interests, and their needs. Well, related to what you just said, um, I know that one of the things that you have proposed is an Office of Public Advocacy. Right. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that idea? Yeah, I think that with this agency, one of the things that we have to overcome is a perception of this culture of cronyism that insiders and, um, quite frankly, the industries that are being regulated by the agency um, have too much control, too much influence over the direction and the decisions that are being made there. This office would report to the legislature on a, um, on a um, bi biennial basis, um, and the purpose would be for it to serve as a resource for Texans, everyday Texans who have issues ranging from their mineral rights to their water quality to permits for common carrier status uh, or permits for disposal wells or whatever the issues may be. Um, oftentimes, unless you have the resources to hire an, hire an attorney uh, and do a lot of your own research and then travel back and forth to Austin, uh, you're not going to be able to even mount a challenge for these issues that you think are important to your community. And so I think in order to help to level the playing field, this, will, this office will work similar to a public defender's office in the criminal system, whereby if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be given to you. And so um, if you cannot afford the resources to demonstrate the merit that you may have in a case, then 
you have someone within this agency that can help you and assist you make those points um, before the hearing examiners uh, so that at the very least you feel like you have a shot. Someone's articulating your concerns. And then every time the legislature goes, goes back into session, this office will report to the legislature um, the trends that they're seeing, the amount of issues that they're addressing and do it on a district by district basis so that the rep representatives in Austin and the state senators in Austin, that they know what's happening in their communities as well and how the Railroad Commission is dealing with those cases. Talking a little bit about transparency, right yeah. now the uh, Railroad Commission doesn't allow staff members to talk right. to the media. Right. Uh, what would you do to increase transparency? Well, it, it's never in the public's best interest. It's never good public policy. Uh, to limit access to public agencies. Just as a standard rule in our democracy, if there is a public agency, we should have access to uh, the experts within that agency who can answer the questions that reporters may have. I think it's, it's, it's very short-sighted of a policy um, to not allow access to the, from the media to staff within that agency, but it further demonstrates this insider cronyism culture that many folks are, are, are feeling. And of course, this is with regards to the media. But I don't think there's a, there are a lot of people in the state who feel like the agency isn't very transparent to them either. And so, you know, if you're not going to be transparent to the media, then a lot of folks have a, a, a higher level of distrust that you'll be open and fair and, and, and accessible to them as well. Uh, and it's important that we don't get the spokesman. I, I get why we have a spokesperson. I mean, they're, they're the spokesperson for a reason. But sometimes the issues are so technical in nature that we don't need spin. We just need the facts. And when you don't allow the folks on the, on the ground to provide those facts, one, it seems like you're hiding something. Uh, but two, it really diminishes the purpose of open government. Uh, and it really um, uh, kind of um, deteriorates um, the level of integrity that the agency is able to maintain. Uh, since we're talking about process, um, with the budgetary co constraints right. across the country, right. uh, government bodies are having to deal with fewer and fewer resources, and certainly the Railroad Commission has very limited resources. So uh, if you were a Railroad Commissioner, how would you um, go about handling the challenges of a very limited bottom line in right. executing the Railroad Commission's mission. Sure. Well, first thing I, I want to say that um, my background is in appropriations. And so um, I've kind of made my living um, from first starting in the House uh, on the Appropriations Committee, working for one of the subcommittee chairs, which is a pretty powerful position in appropriations. And, and just for the folks who are out there watching, the Appropriations Committee is the committee that's responsible for allocating money to these agencies. And so that's where I got my start. And I've worked on issues from general appropriations matters when I first got started to environmental, criminal justice, roads, transportation. The thing I will say about this agency, though, is that it is a 20th century agency trying to regulate a 21st century industry. And that just doesn't match up in this state. As the activity and the oil boom grows in this state, we have to have a regulatory body that can keep up with that growth. Because when we stop doing that, we then put communi communities at risk. And I think that some folks across the state will say that they're already at that point. Here's the deal, is that we don't have a sim the similar problem that other states have because of our rainy day fund and the fact that over 90% of that money that's in the rainy day fund is oil and gas receipts. And so this is money that the industry is paying back to the state in, in, in taxes, and we're just keeping it in its fund as if to just show off that there's money in the fund somewhere. Um, I say reinvest that money back into the agency that is supporting this industry, making sure that the folks in the, in the state uh, are well protected as well. Uh, and I think that can be done. I think one of the things that um, we might talk about in a little bit is a water policy that I put forth this week. And it just says 1% of that rainy day fund um, reserve could be used for research and development for the fracking process in particular to make sure that uh, we are advancing this process so that the challenges that are associated with it and some of the unintended consequences that are associated with it can be mitigated. And we know that there's science and technology out there that can help solve some of these problems. We have to get those things to market and we got to get the operators to start using those new techniques and such. So there is money 
in our, in our state budget. We're, we're fortunate and we're blessed because of that. But and it's money that is there because of the oil and gas industry. So, you know, I'll go to Austin as a, as a railroad commissioner next session, uh, knowing the appropriations process, knowing the finance process. And I'll be able to, to, to build some coalitions on the Appropriations Committee uh, and work towards that final conference committee and making sure that we allocate more resources to this agency so we can keep up with the growth. You talked about the Texas Railroad Commission being a 21st century uh, agency uh, being dealt with, you know, maybe the, the 20th century mm -hmm. uh, tools. Uh, what are some of those tools that you think would take us into the 21st century? First, uh, the, the most obvious is staff. I mean, you know, I want to make sure that we are an agency that has competent and capable staff that is um, uh, widespread throughout the state. And so oftentimes uh, I know that one, the staff turnover is too high. And so oftentimes they get started at the Railroad Commission and then some private company will say, man, you're very sharp. Why don't you come work for us for like fifty thousand more dollars? And they say, "We'll see you later, Railroad Commission." Uh, and so, and that's great. I, I appreciate that. But we have to make sure we're paying staff market value so we can keep them because the continuity is important uh, in, in this agency in particular. Because when you have continuity, you know where the wells are, you know where the issues are, you have a relationship with the community, and you build a relationship where they can come to you without having to come to Austin to find answers about different things that are happening in their community. Uh, and so we want to keep people there. And we don't want the folks, the operators in the field to know more than the agency staff. And that happens way too much, far too often, more often than you would believe. Uh, and so, one, we want to make sure that we have the tools as an agency to do our job properly and function the right way. Um, but in addition to that, we want to make sure that, um, you know, as an agency, that we're meeting the needs, meeting the needs of Texas. And a growing Texas, a Texas that's facing a drought uh, of historic uh, magnitude, um, and a Texas that, that, that has this capability to be self-sufficient energy-wise and help this, the country be self-sufficient, we want to make sure that we have the best tools and utilizing the best practices that we possibly can to continue being a leader for not only the country but also the world. When you're talking about 21st century issues for, for the oil and gas industry, you can't have that conversation without talking about the huge shortage of skilled workers right. to fill right. oil and gas jobs over the next 10 years and especially over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Railroad Commission has a role in trying to address that skilled work gap in the oil and gas industry? Um, as a commission, I'm not sure, but as a commissioner, I would. Um, we propose on our website a workforce training program um, whereby we would partner with some private resources because the companies that we're talking about are just so desperately in need of skilled training workforce as well. Uh, and perhaps some workforce training organizations throughout the state and some community colleges, some vocational colleges, um, and build programs where you can teach folks the skill sets that they need to go out in the old patch and make some good money in the old patch as well. I mean, this is a direct um, access to the middle class. And so this is part of the American dream. We want to make sure that more people have access to this American dream and the, or, and the potential of the American dream. Um, but we need to begin building these relationships with the communities, with, with workforce training organizations, with schools and local universities, and allow for people to, to, to gain these skill sets so they can go out there and, and do this job. But I will say that the old patch is also one of the most deadly uh, places that you can be from nine to five uh, on, a, on a weekday. And so Texas leads the country uh, in uh, oil field deaths and fatalities. And so we have to do something about that as well. And I do think that's a role for the commission to step up and put in place some standards to protect our, wor our workers out there as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We want to give you uh, about 45 seconds to <laughs> Tell the people out there what, uh, why you should be uh, the next Absolutely. Role. Real quick. Um, the goal of this agency, the purpose of this agency, it has a mission. And its mission statement has three components. First is stewardship of our environment and natural resources. Second is concern for public and community safety. Third is enhancing opportunities for economic vitality in this state. We have a commission that focuses a lot on that last piece, but not so much on those other two. Uh, and I think that in order for this agency to work the way that it was intended, it was actually one of the very first consumer advocacy agencies built nationally. That's its foundation. Those are its roots. I want to help 
it turn back to those roots. I want to be the public advocate that the state, state needs in order to make sure that everyone has a voice, that we're stewards of the environment, that we're taking serious interest in the concerns of public safety around the state uh, and at the same time we're enhancing our ability to continue the production of, of oil and gas in the state so i can be that voice and i hope to be that voice uh, if i'm elected well thank you very much you've heard from steve brown who's running for a texas railroad commissioner please stay tuned for the next candidate Thank you for joining us tonight where the League of Women Voters Texas is having a conversation with the candidates for Texas Railroad Commissioner. Today we'll be speaking with Mr. Mark Miller, a Libertarian candidate. Thank Mr. You. Miller, uh, why did you choose to run? Uh, there were actually several reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm a petroleum engineer, so uh, being a petroleum engineer, I have a lot of interest in what goes on with the Railroad Commission. Uh, but secondly, um, as a libertarian, it's very important to me that we start to have third-party voices in the political uh, spectrum. And uh, so I, I have been a libertarian my entire life and thought this was a way for uh, to me to enter into a serious debate as a third-party candidate uh, for this office. Uh, great. So um, I'm, I'm curious what you think about uh, the Sunset Commission recommendations with respect to the Railroad Commission? I actually have uh, endorsed all of the Sunset Commission recommendations. We could talk about them specifically if you'd like, but uh, I have actually in endorsed all of those recommendations. I think they're good ideas. Um, and do you think that they will help the Railroad Commission be more transparent in its, in its workings? Because I think that um, you know, with the inability of people at the commission to speak to the media, for instance, the public just does not have as much information about how the commission works as perhaps other government bodies. I think it would be a good start, but I don't think it's the end. I think there's much, much more that's needed. Uh, and in fact, I've come out publicly against the gag order that they had with the media. I think it's totally inappropriate and has said if, if I'm elected commissioner, the media just has to call me up and we'll, we'll take care of it because it's too important an agency uh, to be sort of hidden from the public and there's, there's too much public distrust of the commission right now that, uh, that we, need to, we need to stop. It just needs to stop. So Mr. Miller, let's just say it's January, you've been elected in November. What are the first three things that you do? First three things that I would do, all right? Um, first of all would be to get past the gag order. Um, they, the other two commissioners won't be able to stop me from talking uh, to the press. Uh, as an engineer and very much aware of a lot of the technical details that the, uh, that the commission is engaged in, it'd be real easy for me to, to get down into all the details of things that the commission is doing. That frankly, the commissioners uh, generally don't have that kind of expertise to be able to, to explain things. Uh, the other thing I would uh, instigate, obviously I'm only one vote, so I'd have to convince the other uh, commissioners, is a sunset policy for regulations. Uh, the Railroad Commission has been in, 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 uh, in, in, in doing its thing for decades, 
and uh, there needs to be some way of, of uh, freshening up those uh, regulations. Some of them are outdated. Uh, a sunset review policy of 10% a year of actually reviewing them and either changing them or discarding and moving on would be another really important thing to do. Well, when we're talking about regulatory innovations, certainly one thing that's very new for the commission is this question of fracking. Mm -hmm. And there have been some rules that have been written in order to increase well productivity and, and some regulation. I'm curious whether you think that the rules in place are sufficient, and if not, how would you change them? Well, we might want to distinguish the actual process of fracking from some of the things that go along with fracking. Uh, fracking itself is, a, is a, what's called a stimulation technique. It's something we do after we drill a well to make it more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and although there's a lot of talk about fracking per se, the real issues are what goes on on the surface or what goes on between the surface and the groundwater. And what we're seeing is uh, a lot of impact, especially as fracking moves into neighborhoods, mm -hmm. as it, because it's geographically very large and it's not gonna stop anytime soon. So we've already seen some of the ramifications in North Texas. South Texas is next. I've even heard complaints from people in Midland of all places. You would think they wouldn't be complaining, but they are because surface rights are really not being protected properly. And so I think that's probably the most important issue uh, facing the, uh, the whole fracking issue is, is how do we better protect people who have surface rights but don't have mineral rights. And what, what do you think is a better way to protect people who have surface rights and not mineral rights? That's a, that's a really good question because part of the state law is such that mineral rights uh, are dominant over surface rights. So the first thing that's got to happen is there's got to be some changes in the law. And I think there needs to be some better balance between surface rights and mineral rights. And I'm, I'm not sure what form that would take. Um, but if you have such a power imbalance, then the surface rights owners just are left out of the conversation. And they need to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And both, both owners have rights. I mean, the surface rights have, have rights to enjoy their property. And the mineral rights have the right to enjoy the economic benefit of that. And so. Uh, I'm not ready to take either one away, but I think there needs to be a better power imbalance, a power, power balance there, excuse me. Okay. Are existing uh, regulations that, with, with consideration to fracking, are they where they need to be? Are they sufficient? Do they need to be increased or decreased? I, you know, I, as far as fracking per se, I'm, I'm not sure there's much I would change. Uh, there are some issues around um, uh, the, the earthquake activity that's being caused by wastewater injection. Those certainly need to be dealt with. Uh, and I've, there's, if anybody wants to go look on my blog, I've got some very uh, uh, significant proposals in that regard. In fact, I've proposed some things to the Railroad Commission directly in their rulemaking process for dealing with things like that. But I, I, I'm not sure much needs to be done uh, at the frac. There may be some, a few things here and there, but I'm not sure what else on the fracking per se. Right. And, and what, are, what are some of those recommendations that you made? Well, there were two, there's two uh, rulemaking uh, things uh, up before the commission right now. One of them is already closed, and it's on eminent uh, uh, domain powers for common carrier pipelines. And the other one is for dealing with seismic activity that might be caused by uh, uh, wastewater injection. And so one of my, uh, I did not like the uh, commission's uh, proposed rules on either one. Um, as far as specific recommendations, the main thing I recommended with regard to eminent domain was more public disclosure about common carrier pipelines with regard to how much of their capacity is actually for third party carriers and not for their own product. And as far as the earthquake activity, the main thing the commission should be doing is moving much more quickly when in those rare circumstances, in those areas where earthquakes do seem to be caused by injection, and it's not everywhere, tends to be very isolated, but to move more quickly to change the well operation so that, uh, so that they can diminish the risks that are associated with it. With as widespread as the uh, oil and gas industry is in Texas, you necessarily have uh, a larger concern when it comes to safety of not only workers, but everyone who touches mm -hmm. oil and gas operations. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the job that the commission is doing with respect to safety and how you might change it if you are unhappy with it. Yeah, the, the part of the problem is I'm not sure the commission has much actual power over safety. Uh, uh, probably some of the things you're referring to are some of the air quality issues mm -hmm. that are occurring. Um, I don't know whether you know that recently Colorado went through a process of kind of uh, figuring out 
what to do about the air quality. And I remember reading an article that suggested from two of the major oil companies that are larger independents that had accepted uh, the recommendations of this panel. And they said, yeah, it's not quite what we want, but we can live with it. And I thought, perfect. That's exactly the kinds of things that have to be done, mm -hmm. where the, most of the industry actually is not a problem. You, what you find in a place like Texas is you'll get a few rogue companies or a few really small fly-by-night companies. Mm -hmm. They tend to be the bigger problem, and the, the larger independents and the majors they don't like the, the black eye that it sometimes gives them. So I, I think there's some ways to work those things out. Unfortunately, we're in this state of dialogue where it's either fracking's all good or fracking's all bad. Mm. And neither one of those are very helpful because fracking's not going to go away. It's here to stay. What we need to figure out is how to do it safely and how to do it in a way that protects people as much as we can. And we need to have a dialogue, not this black-white thing that goes on uh, in the public discourse right now. What role uh, do you think the commission, and, and if you were our commissioner, what role do you think um, you would play in facilitating that conversation toward the center? First of all, lots of public appearances, but I also think it's the role of the commissioners to um, make recommendations to the legislature. And I don't see enough, maybe they're doing it behind the scenes, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be very public. If, if the Railroad Commission is overseeing uh, an industry that, they, that we see these conflicts are creating a problem for folks, um, then we need to bring it into the public attention and bring it to the legislature's attention and say, hey, these are the kind of laws you need to be thinking about changing mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and let's participate in a larger uh, dialogue. I have offered to talk to any environmental group that wants to talk to me uh, and I think every commissioner ought to do the same and they might catch some heat, but that's okay, they're railroad commissioner, they need to do that. Who, if elected uh, commissioner, who are the people that you would reach out to? What groups, what organizations, what other, who needs to be part of that conversation? Well, um, the commissioners should reach out to the oil and gas business, but not in the way we do now. Right now, uh, the, the, the commission is seen as having an advocacy role for uh, oil and gas industry as a champion. And I, I, I have proposed that that needs to go away. But at the same time, the industry would need to know, look, just because you're not the champion doesn't mean you're the enemy. So that, they have to be part of that dialogue. The environmental groups need to be part of that dialogue. And what I hear from the environmental groups is they're willing to engage in that dialogue. They know that fracking's not going away. They just want to make sure that some of the things they're interested in get talked about and, and protected. And then the other would be uh, local cities and, and, uh, and uh, counties. Um, they feel very much left out of the dialogue. Uh, there's a guy named Calvin Tillman. I don't know whether you've read any of his stuff, but uh, he used to be the mayor of Dish. And he, as a mayor of Dish, could not get the attention of the Railroad Commission as a mayor. And he finally, it, his children were having health problems and he ultimately resigned and he's out on the road walking, right? walk, walk, telling people about this and that and the other, but even as a mayor, he couldn't get attention. And that's ridiculous. He was a mayor. Uh, so I'm curious, with respect to um, the railroad's oversight of these oil and gas operations, um, the extent to which you think the current policy encourages environmental stewardship, and if it needs to be better, how um, how the commission could move in that direction, or if you even think the commission should move in that direction. That's a really that's a really good question. Right right now, the commission's biggest environmental issue, if you take away the pipeline issue for just a minute. The biggest environmental issue that the commission actually has regulatory authority over is uh, protecting groundwaters. Uh, I think they've done a pretty good job of that. Um, the, uh, the thing I would like to see more of is more public information about groundwater quality. Uh, even the American Petroleum Institute has recommended to, to drillers, go in and take some baseline water quality samples before you drill because then if nothing else you'll be able to show that nothing happened, you know. And if it did happen, then you step up to the plate and take care of it. Uh, the other one, of course, is, is the uh, air quality uh, issues. Uh, and the, in, uh, the Railroad Commission is out of that dialogue. That's TCEQ's uh, bailiwick. Um, but again, I think there are some ways that the Commission could recommend to the TCEQ, look, here's some things you do. Let's, let's go do what they're doing in Colorado. Uh, they seem to have arranged some reasonable ways of taking care of this that people, the environmental groups and the oil companies can, can agree with. And so they can they can at least have that dialogue with, with something like the TECEQ. When it comes to uh, 
the commission as a whole uh, and, the, and the way that they operate currently, the status quo, what are some things that you think need to change other than transparency, which we've already talked about? The commission needs to be seen as a technocratic institution, not a political one. Uh, part, of the, part of my platform is, look, I'm a nerdy engineer, and that's exactly who we need on the Railroad Commission. We need people who will just get in there and take care of the business, not be running for higher office, but convert it into just an organization that takes care of the issues that are before it. And I think one of the ways to do this is to streamline the commission, get rid of some of the things that ought to be done by other entities, the uh, rate setting stuff ought to be sent over to the PUC. Uh, I believe uh, even the pipeline probably ought to go to the Department of Transportation so that the commission could focus on a very few set of things and be very technical in its approach and not so political. Because everybody sees it as political. They see it as people running for higher office uh, that really they're not sure they're in there taking care of the people's business and that needs to change. It needs to be seen as taking care of the people's business. So to be a really world-class technocracy. Um, mm -hmm. What you have to do is find and keep the best people. So how do you shift, as commissioner, if, if you're elected, how would you shift that way of thinking from this is a stepping stone to this is a place to stay? Well, uh, one of the things you could do, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's not very many people work at the Railroad Commission right now. And a lot of it's sort of bureaucratic paper pushing to take care of, of uh, a lot of paperwork that frankly has to be taken care of. But there are some technical positions. And, and I've seen too much of people at the commission being asked to actually do reports on certain things. And I th uh, Texas has a deep bench of oil and gas. A lot of it's here in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any reason why the commission can't be hiring consultants or whatever and have, have the commission staff overseeing those people. The consultants that I work with, the last thing they would ever want to do is lie on a report that they did because their future business would go away. So I think there's some huge opportunities to raise the technical standards without having to grow the scope of the, of the Railroad Commission and maybe have fewer people that are better paid. You know, the salaries are pretty low over there. It's, it's, if you look at what's, I saw some statistics just this week, a petroleum engineer graduating from the University of Texas Median salary is $100,000 a year. The commissioners make $130,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of see what the problem they have over there. This, is a, this would be a BS petroleum engineering graduate would never go to work for the Railroad Commission because the salary would be half that. Mm -hmm. So I guess tell us a little more about you, uh, the, the man, Mr. Miller. All right. Uh, I've lived in Texas um, about uh, 30 some odd years now. I came here originally to uh, teach at the University of Texas where I taught for about 18 years, petroleum engineering. I'm actually a, a Texas native. I was born in San Antonio. My dad was in the Air Force at the time, so I feel like I came home to my roots and have raised my family here. I live in Austin. Um, I, I, as I say, when I, after I left the University of Texas, I did consulting work and, and now I have a small company that, that uh, writes oil and gas software. Uh, for the oil and gas industry. Um, I had not been very active in the Libertarian Party up until recently, although I tell people, which is true, I first registered as a Libertarian in 1972, which was the first year, you guys probably weren't even born in 1972, uh, was the first year that uh, uh, I could vote. And even then, I understood the importance of, of, of a third party and the importance of what, what I call Libertarian philosophy. And, and a lot of people don't take the time to understand what libertarians really stand for, but it really is about personal freedom for everybody. And I, and I guess in closing, if you could take a minute to talk to the voters, what would, what would you tell them? Uh, what I would tell people is, uh, I, I bring a couple things to the table. One of them is a, a, a very deep knowledge of oil and gas, technical level, that, that I could serve the people of Texas very well. And as a nerdy engineer, uh, politics is not going to be part of my deal. I'm 63 years old. You don't have to worry about me running for governor because my term will be over. I'll be 70. But the other piece is, uh, as a libertarian, uh, we are very conscious of the fact that people's rights and liberties often conflict with each other. They are not absolutes. But we feel very strongly that those rights need to be protected, everybody's rights. And I've talked some a little bit about that tonight. And so. Uh, we, we, we're, the, in the, I think, in the best position to really make sure that 
the commission serves everybody in Texas, not just either a powerful industry or a small subset of that. And uh, that's what I hope to bring to the table, and I hope I can get folks to vote for me in uh, November. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Miller, again, uh, for your time. And we will ask that you hold on for the next candidate. Good evening. We're joined by our final Texas Railroad Commission candidate. Martina, Martina Salinas. <laughs> Salinas. Martina Salinas yes. from the Green Party. Yes. Why did you choose to run for Texas Railroad Commission? You know, I get asked that question a lot, and it's a very hard question for me to answer because it is actually, I thought about it today, and it's, it was a slow burn kind of thing for me. There was just a couple little things that kept adding to the fire and I finally decided that when I was approached by the Green Party to run that I, I needed to do this because um, the state, especially the Railroad Commission, hasn't done a very good job at responding to the concerns of the uh, citizens of Texas. There's too many things going on that aren't explained and all we're getting is we don't have proof of that. So that's why I decided to run. So do what, what you just described, do you view that as a transparency issue or a lack of, of uh, information issue or a lack of research issue? It's both. It's honestly what has happened is that the Roa Commission has um, swayed or has gone away from its original intent, which in the 1890s, it was pushed to the legislator. It was um, formed by Governor Jim Hogg as an advocate, as someone that would protect the interests of private citizens and merchants against a big industry, which was the railroad at that time. And that just sounds very familiar now, doesn't it? So it seems that the commission ha has misinterpreted their, or, well, they're not, they're not doing their original intent anymore which is, I think, where it needs to go back to, which is protecting the interests of private citizens and not industry. Uh, so since it's both, we'll take the uh, transparency piece first. As If you were elected as railroad commissioner, what would you want to see change about the commission with respect to transparency? Well, first of all, I would lift this media band. I understand why it's in place. I work for a, um, a municipality. So I understand why they would want just certain people to speak to the media, but I would think it would be in the fair interest of the citizens of Texas to be able to speak um, to staffers from the Railroad Commission in, you know, in regards to technical and informational stuff that the, the media needs to question about, hey, 
or what about this uh, disposal well? What's going on there? You know, what are their parameters that they should be able to freely speak about that sort of stuff? Mm -hmm. And I guess, uh, Miss Salinas, uh, tell us a little bit more about you. Where are you from? I'm a native Texan. I was born and raised in Laredo, Texas. I am actually a graduate of University of Houston, go Cougs. Um, so it's great to be back here. And I have worked in the construction industry for the past eight years. So anything else? Well, I, you know, that's very interesting because I'm curious where your either professions or your passion found itself intersecting with the oil and gas industry. Well, obviously I'm not an industry insider and I'm not a career politician. So I think that's what brings, that that's my advantage. I'm your everyday citizen. I am any single person watching on TV, I am them. I want to be able to answer their questions. If I can understand them, then maybe I can explain it to them. So I am representing the citizens of Texas. My only vested interests are those of a private citizens, not of industry. And you said just a moment ago that you think one thing that needs to happen is a shift back to the original mission of the Railroad Commission, which was which is protecting the interests of Texans um, with respect to these natural resource issues. So how, how do you think the commission needs to change in order to better address those issues? Well, I think um, one of the things that we would have to do is probably form several task force, um, include industry, include people from the state, um, experts, include citizens, um, political leaders, well, maybe not political leaders, but um, community leaders. And one of the first things that they would need to do is try to solve the problem of um, Azel, where they had the earthquakes and people's houses for damages, and they just want their houses fixed. But who's going to step up and pay for that? I'm sure the state doesn't want to take that responsibility, and I'm sure industry doesn't want to take that responsibility. And right now, the message that you're getting from the state is that there's no proof that any fracking operations have caused those earthquakes. So citizens are, those people are waiting to hear, who's going to pay for my broken house? So then do you think um, that the regulations that are curr currently in place that govern fracking um, are insufficient, or do you think they need to change? Um, I don't know every technical detail in regards to the regulations, but from my understanding, listening to um, and reading um, different articles about fracking in different states, such as Colorado and Pennsylvania, they've shown that disposal well construction, um, insufficient uh, measures have been done that they don't hold up to the pressures of the fracking. So that's something that I think we need to look into to see if work with industry, work with universities to be able to make and design a better disposal well, if that's what we're going to be using, which honestly, if we go away from fracking, that'd probably improve a lot of, that would solve a lot of our problems. You said go away from fracking? Find other measures. Um, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Um, maybe there's another way and we don't you know the industry says that they've that fracking has been going on since the 1890s and but it, it hasn't been done to this extent there hasn't been that many wells you know in the La Paz decade that there are right now so I think we need to step back and take a look at what everything's happening and take everything into compass and be able to say and be able to eliminate things that are happening and be able to say, yes, these things are happening and maybe we shouldn't do those anymore, or no, these things aren't happening as a result of our operations, so maybe we need to reconsider what's going on there. So I think the industry has just gone full steam ahead with in re um, not really considering the uh, effects. Um. Well, certainly one thing that you talk about when you're talking about not just fracking but oil and gas in general is the effect on the environment. So uh, I'm interested to hear what you think 
uh, the Railroad Commission's role in encouraging environmental stewardship is, if you think that the Commission should play a role in encouraging environmental stewardship. That's actually my platform, responsible, um, sustainable development and responsible stewardship. We hold this land in trust. It's not ours. We're actually borrowing it from our children and their children. And what are we going to give them? So we really need to take all factors into consideration in regards to this. What are we doing to our aquifers? The whole state of Texas is an aquifer. There's about 120 aquifers, I believe. And, you know, it's not just Edwards Aquifer. What are we doing to those aquifers? What are we doing to the water that we have, our surface water? We don't have a lot of water in Texas anymore. We have a drought, and we're using huge amounts of water do, to do fracking. So can we say that getting oil and gas out of the earth is more important than having clean water? So I think that's something that the commission really needs to consider. We talked a little bit before about the fact that the Texas Railroad Commission uh, initially had a lot to do with railroads and today it doesn't. Uh, if it were up to you to change the name of the commission, what would it be to better reflect what the commission actually does? Probably something like Texas Energy Commission. Because the, uh, it's, the, com the Railroad Commission doesn't just regulate um, oil and gas. It all has to do with surface mining and alternative energies. So if you, energy encompasses all those. Uh, well, you know, and you mentioned that the, we, we've spent most of our time talking about fracking so far, but there are actually quite a number of different kinds of energy that the Commission oversees. And what we're seeing as the, more of those technologies develop uh, is a shortage in the workforce of, of people with the skills to um, continue pushing energies forward, alternative energies and oil and gas. Do you... What role, if any, do you think that the Commission should play in helping develop the 21st century workforce? Well, I think the Commission really needs to work with the legislator to promote and to fund a more research projects regarding alternative energy, such as solar and wind and ge geothermal. They need to go ahead and give some money to our universities, our universities like University of Houston, A&M, to be able to find those alternative energies and be able to make them efficient and sustainable. And um, it's, it's, it's really, to me, hydrofracking and right now is the easy money, basically. It's, I know it's, you know, it's, it's a technology that's evolved to be able to find these, dis these deposits that they weren't able to find before, but is that really where we want to go? Do we want to keep relying on oil when we can get free energy from wind and solar? Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. If elected, what you know? What are some of the things that you would do to sort of encourage that? Who would you reach out to, and how would you get it done? I would reach out to our universities. I would reach. I would see. I would like to see what um, is currently being researched, and I would like to promote, uh, give grants out. Maybe work with the legislator to give some grants out. Okay, well, very good. So here's what I'm curious about. Um, obviously, we see that your heart is in the environmental um, side of the commission's mission. So I'm curious, if you're elected, um, what are your big three? What are the things that you would really like to accomplish um, as a railroad commissioner? It's not that I'm the environmental side. It's that I'm trying to protect the resources of Texas. I want my grandchildren, if I ever have any, to be able to enjoy the beauty that is Texas. And if we keep at if we keep in the way that we are, that is questionable. Mm -hmm. So one of the my main thing would be um, eminent domain and the use of common carrier status. Um, I have a problem with private industry using the rights of the state to for profit, basically saying to some rancher in Wells County that I'm gonna put a pipeline through your through your ranch and you can't do anything about it. This is Texas. Our land is our land. That is the thing that we're most proud of. And you're gonna have, somebody's gonna come and tell me that they can do anything they want on my land. I think that's wrong. And the second thing would be to promote um, the sustainable energy. Let's go ahead and get some more, let's get some, let's get some work. Let's get some people trained to be able to, to build this industry, let's be a, an industry leader in alternative energy. That's a growth, that's a real big growth market. 
And the third thing would probably be to continue to be an advocate for the citizens. To the citizens, I mean, people in Reno, people in Dish, people in Azel, what they're seeing is the commission and and therefore the state is more concerned, even people in Denton actually, um, they're holding the rights of the industry above their concerns. And I think that's wrong because our best resource is tax, is our citizens, it's our people. What would you say to someone who, uh, what would you say to someone who said that Texas needs to be business friendly and that the environment has its place? What would your explanation to them be? Well, Texas does have a very long and proud history in oil and gas drilling, but are we gonna let short-term gains affect our future? I mean, what, at what cost are we doing all this drilling? I go down 35 and I see gas being burned off because they're more concerned about gathering the oil. But I'm up here in Denton and people that are trying to extract natural gas are up in arms that Denton wants to um, ban fracking. So why is it more important in Denton to be able to get natural gas and we can just burn it in Webb County? I want to circle back to your number one, um, okay. since that sounds like it's really your passion project. Um, and with respect to eminent domain, how how do you think that the Railroad Commission could do a better job of balancing the rights of surface owners with the rights of mineral owners? Well, I think they would have to require that the um, company asking for common carrier status make a case for it. Um, other than just checking a mark, that they need to make a case that this is something that they really need. And I probably would consider, um, and I don't know the legalities of this, of making sure that the property only gets approval. People that are be affected, see if they're okay with it. So hopefully that's something if I'm not elective that that could be considered and changed. Because I mean, anywhere in the state of Texas, whether you're in Van Horn or you're in El Campo. The, just to come onto my property and put something there that I don't get to say, that just, that's just so wrong. And then with respect to your number two, um, in terms of trying to develop alternative energies. Do you think that's something that the Railroad Commission itself should be pushing, or do you think that that is uh, maybe a place for a public-private partnership? I think we could do both. I think we really could do both. And as Railroad Commissioner, how would you make that work? Well, I would, um, it's kind of hard to see into the future, <laughs> but, <laughs> I would try to see, um, let's see who's interested. Who wants to come in with the state of Texas developing these new industries? Do we want to work with an energy company in Sweden? I mean, Germany has, what, 30% of their energy coming from solar, and they don't even have half the sun that we get. So I think we need to open the doors to industry to that. And if you could take 30 seconds to 45 seconds to talk to the people, uh, what would you say to them? I would say that I am your advocate. It's not that I hold environment over business. I'm not trying to take your kid's food out of their mouths. I'm not trying to take your mortgage payment away from you. What I want is for us to take a step back and look at what we're doing. Is this something that we can really sustain for the next 50 years? And if we could, is it something we really want to do? What kind of land, what kind of state are you going to be handing off to your children? What kind of water? Will we, will we have water in the next 10 years that we can use? Will we have um, clean land that we can go to that we know that hasn't been polluted? Or is the state of Texas going to be a big super fun site? You know, there's good companies, there's bad companies, and there's good companies that make mistakes. And I just want to make sure that everybody is trying to work for the best that is Texas. And if they don't, then we don't need them here. We really need, we, we need to prevent anyone that hasn't been working in good faith 
from, from working here. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Salinas, for your time. And thank you very much at home for joining us tonight for the League of Women Voters Texas uh, conversation with the candidates. Tonight we spoke with the candidates that are running for Texas Agriculture Commissioner and Texas Railroad Commissioner. Please take a moment and visit the League at lwvtexas.org via phone at 512-472-1100. And don't forget, if you want to go online and see your ballot, to go to vote 411 Dot org to get your ballot. On behalf of the league, on behalf of co-host Rita Hicks, thank you very much and good night.